Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host. And I have a favor to ask. If you're appreciating what we're doing here, I've enjoyed hearing some of the awesome guests we've had. Think of a friend or someone you know who might like it as well and tell them about it. That's the number one way word gets out. And it's easier than ever to find us. We're on politicsandreligion.podbean.com. Politicsandreligion.podbean.com. The and is spelled out. And soon we'll shorten it up even more to politics and, politics and religion.us. But for now, check out the Podbean site and consider supporting us any way you feel inspired. And without further ado, today's guest, I have to give a major shout out. One of our favorite prior guests and, and now friend of the pod, Elizabeth Newman, along with her awesome husband, Flyer Gill, Gil Newman, suggested that I reach out to Dr. Knapp Nasworth and have him on the program. And I am so glad that I did. Knapp Nasworth has a PhD in poli sci with the focus of his dissertation on the Christian right. And after working for a number of years in academia, Knapp went on to be the politics editor and political analyst for the Christian Post, the leading online Christian news media outlet, which he did for eight and a half years before he had to part ways with the organization after they, as he put it in, in a piece for Arc Digital, sold their soul to Trump. Dr. Nasworth is now the executive director of American Values Coalition, which as they describe is a growing community of Americans empowered to lead with truth, reject extremism and misinformation and defend democracy. Dr. Knapp Nasworth, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Great, it's great to be here and talk about politics and religion without killing each other. We'll try, we'll try not to kill each other. That, that would be a, that would be an above average day if we, if we accomplish that. <laughs> so, so I, I wanted to start with your early years. You did your undergrad at the University of Florida, master's at University of Central Florida, and then back to uh, University of Florida for your PhD. Did you grow up in Florida? Uh, mostly Orlando. I went to high school in Orlando, born in Jacksonville. Also lived in South Georgia for some time as a kid. Okay, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, we we have some folks we really love. Emily is a is a our our friend Emily Matthews is is from Georgia. I think went to UGA too. But uh, like I said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I actually taught at UGA for a year. Oh, you did? Oh, that's which so was uh, interesting as a Gator. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How was that? <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, me and the students kind of ragged on each other as. But I'm I'm happy that the year I worked there, the Gators beat Georgia. So that was that was delightful. <laughs> yeah, it makes life a little bit easier. Well, I do have to say War Eagle, but maybe that's for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was also curious about your Christian formation. Did you grow up in a Christian home, going to church and all that? Or was that something that you came to later on? It was mostly later on. We occasionally went to church when I was a kid, but my maternal grandparents were very much churchgoers, devoted churchgoers. He was a farmer, sort of a very small town church situation. Um, so, you know, whenever I was at their house on the weekends, we would always go to church. But really, I gave my life to Christ at a young life camp in between my junior and senior year of high school. Yeah, you had you've mentioned Young Life a couple of times. So for our listeners, could you could you describe what Young Life is? And then then you ended up uh, volunteering for Young Life, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah, Young Life is a ministry for high school kids. Also, that well, they have some outreach to middle school kids as well, but mostly focus on high school kids. It's a parachurch organization, so it's not tied to any particular denomination. So lots of different denominate, lots of different churches and denominations are involved in the organization. So it's usually uh, their weekly programs are in people's houses rather than in churches to make it a, 
a, a place for high school kids who maybe are reluctant to get, enter into a church, might go to a friend's house, you know, and they have summer camps all over uh, the country as well that they uh, bring kids to, to hear the gospel. Yeah. It's interesting, the timing of that, because you, you did your undergrad in poli sci, master's in poli sci, and then ultimately your PhD in political science with a focus on the Christian right. So mm -hmm. just tracking with when you became a Christian, I was curious why that was a curiosity of you. Like what was driving all of that work and, and investigation throughout your education? Yeah, it was an interesting time, you know, that so this would have been the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, the Christian right was very active during that time. You also had a lot of uh, scandals involving TV preachers that was taking place. So it was very much in the news. And at the time, I, I was also volunteering for Young Life, which is not a political organization at all, you know, not doesn't take any sort of partisan stance at all or anything like that. But, you know, I had uh, both those things going on in my life, studying politics and volunteering for young life so it just i guess it became a natural thing for me to be interested in where religion and politics intersect and so ended up eventually getting my master's with a focus on religion and politics and then i returned to university of florida because they had dr ken wald he's one of the foremost experts on religion and politics there at my alma mater so i was able to go back and study under him yeah yeah. And, and just so we can benefit a little bit from all that education, you know, I've, I've heard you give some summaries, the, the trajectory of the Christian right from the 80s, 90s into the Bush era, and then fact kind of moving forward now into the Trump or maybe post Trump area, you know, but I, I'd love for you to give us a, an overview of that historical trajectory. Yeah, that, that's this is a little bit about what my dissertation was about. So I was studying the Christian right during the first George W. Bush term. And so, and looking back on it now, it was like, a, yeah, you know, you don't realize it when you're in there at the moment, but looking back on it now, I would say that that was really sort of the peak of the Christian right. They were really able to accomplish a lot. You know, you had Republicans for a, a time for about two years, controlling both houses of Congress. A Republican president, mostly sympathetic, not entirely, but mostly sympathetic to the Christian right. And so they, they were able to get a number of their priorities in uh, place. And also they, they were very much, it was, it was a very different sort of Christian right than we see today. They were very much willing to push back against the Republican party whenever the Republican party wasn't sort of meeting their agenda items, wasn't paying attention to them. And the Republican Party had to respond because the Christian right was very much involved in mobilizing a lot of their base voters, right? And so that, that's very different from the Christian right we saw under Trump, which was not really willing to push back very much at all uh, whenever Trump would do things that they disagreed with. You know, for instance, on uh, refugees, you know, the, the Christian right and also just evangelicals more broadly, not just conservatives, have always been supportive of refugees, often who are Christians themselves, but uh, also any sorts of refugees. Uh, it's just sort of a very sort of biblical understanding of, you know, you you help people who are, are fleeing war, you know, and, and things like that. You know, when, when Trump started shutting down the refugee program, you know, you saw you heard a little bit of noise from the Christian right, but they, they weren't very loud about it. They weren't and they weren't able to really influence Trump in any way. That's just one example. But for, for the most part, what, what has happened now is that they've sort of become just an extension of Trump rather than sort of their, their own thing, uh, where they, they just, uh, Trump has become so influential in the direction of the Christian right. Yeah. You know, they're, they, aren't, they aren't really standing on their own anymore. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, that you describe it that way. One of the first times that I saw your name or, or one of your published works outside of the Christian Post was, it was back in early to mid 2020, I read this collection called The Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump, 30 Evangelical Christians on Justice, Truth, and Moral Integrity. And you contributed a chapter. <laughs> I, in fact, when we started TPNR, this, this podcast, one of the first things I did was reach out to a number of the contributors, uh, but you know just didn't have access. So <laughs> it was really a thrill to be able to, to 
you know, to hear your name from Elizabeth and Gil and, and that we're, we're talking now. But I, I'd like to talk about that collection for a second. In contributing to projects like uh, The Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump, did it cost you anything? Did it open you up to more criticism or, or harassment or, or anything along those lines than, than you'd already been facing? Well, it's interesting. I was so I was first recruited and had started. I'm trying to remember. I think I think I finished the chapter the month I left the Christian Post. So it was before it was published, before it came pub became public. But it was all sort of happening about the same time. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what, so what we've seen now, and sort of what I've gone through, and a lot of other people gone, have gone through, is that Trump has opened up a division within evangelicalism. It's sort of a division that was always sort of there underneath the surface, but, you know, we were able to sort of work it out kind of situation where evangelicals on either side of this divide were able to work together uh, by and large. But what I'm talking about is what's sometimes been referred to as sort of a neo-evangelical versus fundamentalist evangelical split, right? And so the election of Trump sort of opened up that split. And it has created more divisions where you it's something that was always there, but now you're seeing it more clearly. Right. And, and then it, Trump has caused those different types of evangelicals to take sides. Right. And not just Trump, but sort of everything that sort of goes along with Trump, Trumpism, you know, we could call it. Yeah. So, for instance, you know, so for on issues of uh, like, let, let's take racism, you know, this notion of whether you know, racism is still a problem today and it needs to be addressed within the church and within the community at large. You know, we're seeing this split, you know, between the two sides, um, the issue of immigration. Do we want more immigration? Do we, you know, that, that sort of those sorts of issues, neo even evangelicals tend to be much more pro immigration, but a lot of it really has to come down to how you think about political power. So neo evangelical, it, the, the view is more, we're one group within many in this pluralistic society. We're going to work together to build bridges of understanding where we can work together. And, and so we're just one group among many, and we support pluralism, you know, in the, broadly in this democracy. But the sort of the Trumpism, the Trumpish fundamentalist type of evangelicalism, it's more political power you seek and use to your benefit and to defeat your enemies, uh, your political enemies. It's, it's much more of a power-based understanding of, you know, it's, it's how you use power over people you disagree with. So it's, it's a different way of thinking about how political power is used. And so, so these sort of divisions have sort of opened up now within this sort of era of Trumpism. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really ironic so first of all, I, I do have to say that I, I had started, I, I, I read my Bible every day. I take it very seriously. And I had started, I, I had already started seeing that the Bible sort of be the best testimony against the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump. But that collection really helped me gather my thoughts more clearly and, and really had me not doing sort of proof texting, looking for reasons not to support Trump, but like it, it just sort of jumps out at you. And, and on a daily basis, it's not just Trump himself, but the movement itself. In one of the articles I was reading, you linked to another article that was quoting a lot of, we'll call them fundamentalist pastors that are getting very politically active. And one pastor after another was referring to things that, that I was thinking, have you read your Bible? You know, for example, one pastor was saying, Jesus was not some sandal wearing, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, he kind of was wearing sandals. And, you know, in fact, he uses sandals in certain, you know, parables and metaphors that he he shared with us, you know, and, and constantly referring to uh, turning over tables. You know, he's the, he's the guy that's turning over tables when he was 13. I'm like, wait, wait a second. That wasn't when he was 13. <laughs> you know, that, that was... A little bit later on, it might have had something to do with something other than supporting Donald Trump. But um, but the, the the larger point is is how if you do take your scripture seriously, it, it's really hard to reckon with the, the the level of support that Donald Trump has had within evangelicalism. But 
also reading your work has has illuminated something about that. You you actually pointed out the 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 oft quoted eighty one percent support for Trump is uh, from from evangelicals is something of a myth, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's been one of my great frustrations. How often that number is misused because because the the pollsters will first ask if you're your race, and then they'll only ask white people if they're evangelical for one. So that opens up a problem. And then what happens is the white gets dropped. Everyone associates evangelicalism with white evangelical and, and just continues to quote the 81%, which was also, you know, it was probably closer to, to 76 actually, when you got a more accurate picture of that. The way that another way to think about this is that evangelical is just a very fuzzy term these days. And so what you have is also in there is evangelicals who hold people who hold evangelical beliefs, but who don't want to identify as evangelical because evangelical has become so synonymous with Trumpism. Yeah. And so they don't want to be associated with that. So they no longer want to be called evangelical, even though their beliefs are very much in line with evangelicalism. And then you also have people who, because of the association with Trump will identify as evangelical, even if they don't even go to church, you know, so they, they're like, Oh, if evangelical means Trumpism and I'm for Trump, then I'm an evangelical. And so that complicates the situation. And then pollsters will also complicate the situation by including born again. in the question, do you consider yourself evangelical or born again? Well, born again, that's just straight from the new Testament, you know? And so lots of Catholics and mainline Protestants, a lot of people will, Christians will identify with the born again label. So it, it's, it's just a very complicated, uh, you know, it's a very difficult, it's a very imprecise uh, number when you look at that 81% number. And I think, you know, when I was talking about the neo evangelical versus fundamentalist evangelical, you know, if you include non white evangelicals, the best estimate I could come up with is really, I think they're probably about equally split. But again, it's so imprecise, it's really hard to say. I should also add that the way that we're using that I've been using the term fundamentalist in this conversation is very ahistorical. So there's, there's a historical fundamentalist movement, you know, in the early 1900s. And so that's, uh, I, I don't want to conf confuse it, but that's, I'm, we're just sort of stuck with this language. So that's the language I'm using. I, I love, it's the first time I think I've heard the term neo evangelical, because I should, I should just embrace the fact that language is constantly evolving, but honestly, I've had a hard time with certain important words or important ways of, of naming our identity in some cases, like evangelical or words like patriot or <laughs> truth, truth social. You know, I am ambivalent about whether to just give up that, those words or give up that way of describing an identity. Uh, and to find new ways of describing it, or to fight the good fight and say, no, words words are important. Words matter. Uh, I, this I, this isn't necessarily within your expertise, but curious what your thoughts are on on that. Well, do you want me to complicate it even more? <laughs> sure. Yeah, let's do it. So let, let's let's just go over a quick sort of overview of how these words have changed. So in the early 1900s, there was the fundamentalist versus modernist controversy. And so that's where the term fundamentalist comes from. There was a publication, a series of books called The Fundamentalists. And so evangelicals of that time began referring to themselves as fundamentalists. The modernists influenced the mainline, what became the mainline congregations. Often a lot of them were like split between the fundamentalists and the modernists. The fundamentalists became evangelical. The modernists became mainline. And then then you get to the 1950s and you have Christianity Today, Billy Graham, and a bunch of other folks who don't like the fundamentalist label anymore and want to be known more as Christians who carry the Bible in one hand and the New York Times in another. And so they started calling themselves neo evangelicals, then dropped the, dropped the neo level, neo label. And so they started calling, and then so it became evangelical as a way to distinguish themselves from fundamentalists. They wanted to distinguish themselves from fundamentalist evangelicals, right? And so, and, and but, but then now, but then over time, 
the fundamentalists became more like the neo evangelicals, the Billy Graham wing became more influential. And so all these things are kind of uh, became sort of mixed together. And so, so that nowadays people think of evangelical and fundamentalists as the same thing. And in some ways they are, but you know, as far as historically, and now, now we're seeing the split again, much like the fundamentalist modernist controversy a hundred years ago. Now we're seeing a, a new split within evangelicalism. You know, what do you call it? Like th th this is just sort of the language we're kind of stuck with is neo versus fundamentalist because that's, that's the terms I've been, I've seen being used. It, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because as you were describing the distinction between fundamentalist and evangelical historically, I don't imagine it goes back even further to uh, maybe when, when Darwin published some of his findings and how that sort of entered into the how the church was teaching on on uh, Genesis and things like that uh, into the, the late 1800s even. But I see some parallels between how your relationship with the Christian post evolved, <laughs> so to speak, over time and your ultimate parting of ways with them. So. When you first got to the Christian Post, you, you described it as an uneasy fit at first, but you said, but academics and journalists share a common mission to be truth seekers and truth tellers. And, and that was your experience for much of your time there, wasn't it? Yeah, I very much sort of took from my experience as, uh, as an academic and kind of brought that into my journalism. You know, I, I just felt like I was doing the same sort of thing, except as a journalist, I just, you know, as if you're in academia doing, doing research and so forth, you know, if you're a legit academic, you know, really doing your job as you should, you just want to find the truth. It's, it's, you don't have like any agenda behind your research. It's like you have an interesting question in your head. You want to know the answer to that question. And so you go out and research it. And wherever the research finds you, you know, whatever the research finds, that's what you publish, right? That, that should be like how academia works. I think by and large it does. And so I, that, that's, that's sort of my mindset going into journalism. It's like, let me take my readers on my journey of seeking the truth, right? You know, you go out, you interview people and, and, and you report what you find. And th so that's how I think of what the job of a journalist should be, you know? Yeah. You know, as you describe that, I'm remembering what my impression of one of the first big academic publications that I really tried to tackle after becoming a Christian was N.T. Wright's big books, uh, starting with New Testament and the People of God. And that's exactly what struck me about his work is that he must have entered into that project as a historian, risking the possibility that he would really mess up some of his theological undergirdings. Does that make sense? Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it strikes me in, in seeing, uh, I, I don't know if, if it seems that you, you became a Christian not too long before you started entering into some of this academic work. But I'm curious if you faced some of that possibility as you got later into your academic work, if what you were finding in your research was, was shaking up some of your theological or philosophical foundations. Not so much for me. I mean, I, th I think I was, you know, so I was studying the Christian right and I was uh, looking at it from a political science perspective as a social movement, right? And sort of similar to the civil rights movement. You know, I, I kind of went into it as somebody who I had some sympathies with the Christian right views, you know, as, a, as an evangelical and as a conservative and also just some concerns about their approach to politics, you know, as as many it, it's sort of similar to a lot of christians you know how, how they would view the christian right today yeah so i i got so i got to dc and i interviewed a lot of people i interviewed a lot of christian right leaders by and large what i found during that time is you know there just a lot of people involved in the christian right who were just legitimately felt like they you know they wanted to influence government for good what they thought thought was the common good yeah. And so, you know, it was interesting taking that uh, research then to academia, which tended to be more left leaning often. And so I, I would do job talks and so forth. You know, one of the one of the criticisms of a lot of the research done on the on 
the civil rights movement was that the people researching the civil rights movement were too sympathetic to the civil rights movement. And so they, it lacked some objectivity. So I, I, I avoided any sort of normative, you know, evaluation of the Christian right, which was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly for those left leaning for some of those left, not everyone, but some of those left leaning academics, you know, when I went to a job talk to talk about the Christian right, they just wanted to hear a critique of it. So, and I was like, you know, just wanted to be more of an objective observer of the Christian right. Oh man. Now I'm, I'm imagining what your, uh, how your defense of, of, of your dissertation might've gone. Were, were there folks on the panel where you had to defend your PhD that were really scrutinizing your work in that regard? No, no well, not on my dissertation panel because they were all, you know, they, they were, these were all professors who I'd worked with for a long time and got to know real well. And, and they, yeah, so they, you know, this was the, the direction I took was the direction they were guiding me to take already. Right. So it was really more what I'm talking about is when I went on uh, what's referred to in academia as a job talk, where a, a school will fly you in to talk to a bunch of professors and then present your research, you know, when you're applying for a position. And so the, some of those got interesting. Oh, man, I can only imagine. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for some of those conversations. Uh, although I think I've not that I've been a part of that exact type of dynamic, but I, I find myself in that dynamic. But on any either side of it. Like if I'm hanging out with my church friends, I might be, someone might be giving me the third degree, assuming that I'm coming from one angle. If I'm hanging out with my friends in the entertainment industry, they might assume that I'm coming out from another angle. So it's yeah. uh yeah. So that's an interesting dynamic, but just, just to be clear, when you went to uh, the Christian post, I think you described yourself as theologically and politically conservative. Isn't that right? I still describe myself that way. Yes. Oh man. We talk about a term that's been hijacked. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I did want to, uh, I, I, in looking back at your, your early work, uh, from, from CP, you have this long track record of, of holding theologically, politically conservative positions. So for example, you had a series of pieces that were sympathetic to those who opposed gay marriage. Uh, but there was one piece back in, I think it was 2015, that I wanted to bring up because it, it displays a certain nuance in your handling of that issue in the lead up to the Supreme. It, yeah, it was to 2015 because it was the lead up to the Supreme Court case that basically established gay marriage as being legal across the country. And the piece I was thinking of is one where you, as the writer, didn't so much object to gay marriage so much as how certain supporters of gay marriage took great pains to try and silence and even ruin the livelihoods of those they saw as opponents, like the uh, pastry shop and, and a, a flower shop who couldn't provide their their uh, creative services for for gay uh, a gay wedding based on religious convictions. So whether you want to discuss, I don't know if you remember that particular article or not, um, or the issue more broadly, I'd love to hear what you thought of all that now, seven years later, and all that's happened in, in our culture since. Have any of your views changed or morphed in any way with, with all that's happened in, in the subsequent years? Well, I mean, it's, it, the same-sex marriage debate is a debate that my side lost clearly and decisively, <laughs> and I don't think that that's going to change, you know, in my lifetime. But I do think it, 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 the debate over the freedom of those, the freedom of dissenters, people who dissent to the majority, you know, how are we going to treat those in society? I think that's the most important debate going forward. And I think the Supreme Court so far has come down on the right side of this, which is we're going to have a country where we have gay marriage and we have the freedom to dissent to gay marriage. And, and, and I think that that's where we should be. And uh, so a lot of these uh, efforts to, to punish people who, uh, who don't agree with, with the direction, you know, in a pluralistic society, we should have the freedom, you know, to, to not go along with the majority. And I think that's sort of where we, you know, that that's the reason we have a bill of rights in the first yeah. place. Right. You know, I, I think, you know, that that's where the Supreme court is. That's not where everyone is on the left for sure these days. And I think if they continue, continue to push in that direction, it's going to turn off a lot of moderates uh, is, you know, I, I, let me say this. I've, I've, I was also just extremely frustrated with what happened after the, 
Supreme Court allowed for same-sex marriage because I felt like the left, the argument that they were using was that this won't affect you. Why, why are you opposed to gay marriage? Nobody's, nobody wants to change your life. Nobody wants to, you know, this is just about uh, freedom, right? Freedom for us is it, not going to hurt you in any way. And then almost as soon as, you know, the Supreme Court decision, they're like going after the wedding baker and the photographer and all these sorts of things. And, you know, I, I just felt like it was sort of a, you know, the Lucy and the football situation, or <laughs> if that's the right metaphor, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting needle to thread. And I think though, it seems to me that the conservative legal movement has found that fine line where, you, you know, I can't necessarily impose my beliefs on my neighbor. I think this was back in, was it 04, the Prop 8 in California was on the, it must have been because Carl Rove put a lot of those, those initiatives on the ballot for, for um, W's reelection. And I came to the conclusion I might have certain convictions, theologically based convictions, but I can't necessarily impose those convictions on my non-Christian neighbor, my neighbor who doesn't necessarily defer to the Bible as their authority. So I, I took more of a libertarian view. As long as I was allowed to, as long as I was given space to come to my own conclusions and and given that space to 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 have my own beliefs, right? So when those cases arose after gay marriage was was made legal, uh, where someone was made to um, offer up their creative services for a, a, a marriage or a union that they didn't necessarily believe in, it, it was like others' beliefs were being imposed on that baker or that flower shop owner. You know, similarly. I think there there have been a lot of cases, and, and the Supreme Court came down in favor of the Baker. The I forget, I forget the exact cases. We'd have to call in David French and Sarah Isger to remind us of them. But I'm pretty sure that the conservative legal movement won out in that regard, where there was a libertarian stance on gay marriage itself, whereas the Bakers and the, the flower shop owners weren't uh, forced to participate in something that they didn't necessarily believe in. I, do I have that right? Well, that I mean, that that's, you know, what we're talking about is where the libertarian split switch, right? So the libertarians were with the pro-gay marriage crowd. Right. Right. And then as soon as the gay marriage proponents wanted to start punishing people who dissented, that's when they flipped and said, no, no, we're, we're not with you on this. Now, now we're with the other side uh, because we, we think you should have the freedom to dissent as well. Yeah, yeah. Now talk about something even more nuanced is what's happened over the last couple of years with mask mandates and vaccine mandates. I've I I certainly <laughs> there have been any number of cases where I just found myself on this uh, different sides of a supposed line. For example, when Ron DeSantis uh, in Florida, your home state, said that private businesses can't impose their own mandates, whether it be pertaining to uh, vaccines or masks, I thought. That's like the most anti-conservative thing I could think of. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a small business owner. And if I so ch freely choose within my business, my private business to say, hey, listen, if you want to work here, especially when given given options, like, listen, all right, it, you're really, really against vaccines. I'm going to have to test you as, uh, on a weekly basis, you know, especially when there's when there's inform you're given uh, your your employees options of informed consent about it, you know, so. On that time, that time I was uh, I found myself on the opposite side of a leading conservative figure like Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis. There were other times, though, where I felt, man, that's that's a kind of overreaching it, you know, imposing vaccine mandates, like forcing private companies to impose uh, vaccine mandates on all their employees, like an outside force, a governmental force saying, no, large business, you have to enforce uh, this this um, mask or vaccine mandate. I, I, I was much more ambivalent about those imposing mandates on private businesses than I was um, about other iterations of this. Where, where did you come down? On, I, so actually, I should point out, American Values Coalition has done a lot of work in this area, educating, confronting misinformation. So if you want to talk about that a little bit, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, yeah, uh, sure. So well, Governor Abbott, here in Texas, I'm in Texas now, has done the same thing as DeSantis and imposed mandates on businesses. So, you know, 
it's it's such a like mixed use of language where you know they'll say they're opposed to mandates meaning uh, a mask mandate but then implement their own mandate telling businesses what they can't do right like it, you you can't require your employers to wear a mask or something like you know and things like this so that's still a mandate you're still yeah. favoring a mandate it's just a mandate in the di- in a different direction so you can't say you're anti opposed to mandates if you're out there mandating what businesses aren't allowed to do yeah and as far as like what we're doing with the american vice coalition you know our concern is the misinformation that's being spread by right-wing media sources you know and so these could be you know cable news but also what we're seeing a lot now is people are getting their news and information from podcasts yeah (laughs) youtube and you know the all these sorts of places you know even like my email inbox, you wouldn't believe some of the crazy stuff that I get through email, uh, I guess, because of some of the other lists that I've signed up for. There's so much misinformation regarding vaccines. And uh, that's, that's taken, that's out there now. I mean, we wouldn't need a mandate if, if a lot of these, I th- well, a lot of them, I think are hucksters just trying to make money, trying to make a quick buck. So a lot of this mif- misinformation wasn't out there, then no, no one would be even considering a ma- mandate to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do want to get into your parting with the Christian Post, but since we're talking about it, could you tell us, could you talk a little bit more about American Values Coalition, uh, the organization that you lead? I, I love how you describe its uh, raison d'etre, if you will. There is an exhausted majority desiring to heal our broken polity. American Values Coalition provides shelter for these politically homeless by reconnecting them to a fact-based national narrative in order to prevent radicalization and restore democratic norms in America. So tell us more about how this all started and and what you hope to achieve with American Values Coalition. Yes, thank you. So a lot of um, just over the past four or five years now, a lot of people who like me maybe are conservative, evangelical or conservative Christians or perhaps just live in communities with conservatives have seen this disinformation, misinformation crisis, dividing their families, splitting their friendships, dividing churches, uh, radicalizing people, making people more extreme in their politics. And so there, there's a lot of people out there like what I've gone through who are just, uh, at a loss as to what to do and are just frustrated with what's taking place just personally in their own lives. And so what we want to do at the American values coalition is to help build a community of people who, who are going, who are going through these same struggles and just to let them know that they are not alone. There are other people who are uh, experiencing these struggles as well and to, to just help them with that community and providing them with, with information, with resources, uh, with ideas on, on what to do to help repair the damage that's been done by, by the right wing misinformation. Yeah. That it's, I, I think it's a, it's a much needed salve to some of the problems that are at the center of, of what's wrong in our society right now. And I really, I really appreciate what you're doing. So what, what are some of the biggest hurdles that you're overcoming? It's still a, it's still a pretty young organization, isn't it? Yeah, we, we only went live just in October. So uh, yes, we're very young, just getting started. But you know, we've, we've already had a few webinars and uh, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out. Uh, we're also working on, we did a, a pastor workshop and um, I'm currently working on scheduling some upcoming in-person conferences uh, for pastors because we, we hear a lot from pastors who have, who are struggling with this in their own congregation, who have seen these splits happen with their, within their own congregation. You know, it's, it's just a matter of reaching people because we know that there's a, a big audience out there who, who've, who've dealt with this. Uh, so it's just a matter of getting our name out right now. And I, I think the audience is there. We just uh, need to find them. Good stuff. And this is all a continuum for, you know, what's been happening for you personally and professionally for a long time, I did want to go back to the Christian post and looking back at some of your personal professional relationships from your time there, you cite instances when folks you collaborated with for years at one time had a great deal of respect for 
would publish knowingly false or misleading pieces in order to uh, express unequivocal support for Trump or Trumpism. So do you have a sense of how individuals previously exhibited discernment, goodwill, good faith, and specifically journalistic integrity ended up breaching numerous lines of integrity again and again, some even to this day? Like, how does that how does that disintegration or corruption happen? Yeah, it's I get that question a lot. It's been an amazing thing to watch. And so I think there's a couple, there's probably a few answers here, sort of different things that are going on at once. One, one is that we know from uh, research that our brains are sort of naturally tribal. And so what happens in our brains is that, you know, we, it, it's very hard to sort of think outside of defending our tribe. And so, you know, when you're a Republican, for instance, and have strong ties to Republicans or to conservative movement or the Christian right, or, you know, whatever it is, what happens in your brain is that all the information that comes from those resources, you're more likely to believe. Mm. And any information that tries to push back against that, you're more likely to reject. And so it's, it's sort of this phenomenon that happens in our brains that uh, it's just very hard to sort of think outside of to, to be non-tribal, you have to like consciously like seek and be open to alternative viewpoints and to really deeply consider alternative viewpoints and things like that. So it, it's just not a natural position for us to do as humans. It's something that we have to really work at. Now, there's some other theories out there. You know, I, uh, I've spoken to people like Kristen Cubbis Dumay, the historian who wrote Jesus and John Wayne, you know, her, you know, a lot of her thinking goes to, well, a lot of these ideas, these Trumpish ideas were already there within evangelicalism for a long time. And so it, it so, so she sees it as more of a natural fit. I think there's probably, there's something to that as well. And so, but, you know, it's, it's complicated. I think a lot of these processes are taking place at the same time. You know, we, we have also have a lot of new research on Christian nationalism and how Christian nationalism, just looking at the data, really was a good predictor of who voted for Donald Trump, even more so than people who identified as evangelical. So that that gives us a sort of a, a way to, to, to grasp this, this issue as well. So, I, yeah, so I'd say sort of a combination of things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, and, and there, it shows up in ways that you might not even realize when you're doing. You did a recent uh, post about follow, unfollow. You know, let, let's let's go out of our way to maybe follow some voices that we don't necessarily agree with, and those that you unfollow, maybe think about that. You know, because if you're only following those who kind of harmonize with where your predisposition is, you're you're doing you're manufacturing the the exactly what you're talking about. So there's, there's so many different ways that this can show up. And, uh, but I, I take your point, you know, I, I have tried to seek out good journalists, say in, in a, in a platform like Breitbart, because believe it or not, there are actually, you know, for, for my folks who lean left, there are some good reporters in, in those, or back in the day, Washington times, for example, was seen as this radical, you know, publication, but there are some great reporters that have come out of there. So, you know, but it is something that we have to tend to and we have to make an effort towards so that we're not ultimately part of the problem and, and just joining a, a tribe of another sort, you know, I'm curious if, if you've talked. Yeah, can, can, I, can I just sure, yeah. reiterate what you just said there? Because uh, it, it's very true. And that's, this is an important point, I think, for people to understand, because I've, I've had people message me privately as well, who they work for these right-wing media organizations who are push, pushing the misinformation. But, you know, if, if, if this is your paycheck, if this is, you know, if you have kids, you know, who need diapers, you know, you, you can't just like get up and leave the job, you know, and then I, I, you know, and then you have the additional problem of it makes it harder to find a new job because you were where you work. And so I, I just hope that people, people who are doing hiring and other media organizations, uh, you know, don't just reject somebody because they work because of who they work for, because they may be desperate to get out for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. No, in, in my, one of my businesses, 
had a lot to do with placing people at different places, um, different companies, and the expression, seeing the talent through the credits uh, became really critical. Again, it's just a matter of discernment. You know, this person might be working on certain type of fare, whether it's, um, you know, like, like I said, I come from the entertainment industry. If they're working on a lot of uh, sitcom type work, are they capable of working on, you know, big Marvel movies or something like that? And it takes a special creative person to see, no, this person really knows how to edit. This person really knows how to write. It doesn't matter what they're working on. Similarly, in journalism, uh, you know, you, you describe a great deal in that art digital piece that the challenge that you faced on a day-to-day -day basis and the increasing uh, repeated challenges and conflicts that you were facing internally before it ever became public and you ultimately had to make that decision. You have described this before, and, and I would point folks to that ARC digital piece, but it, could, could you tell us what that decision ultimately was? Like when, when was it that you said, man, I have to, I have to do this thing. I have to take this risk. I can't, my conscious won't just won't allow me to do this anymore. Uh, you mean to leave or to write the arc digital, please? Not the not the digital to uh, to leave. Yeah, to leave uh, the Christian Post. It was sort of an on the spot thing. It was <laughs> just to bring people back. So this was like the day before Christmas, and I was about to leave on a two week vacation. You know, I got, I got the phone call in the afternoon. I, it's, it's close to my shift being over. We have this editorial we want to publish editorial meaning this is the voice of the christian post not just an opinion piece this is some a statement that we want to make i had this long phone call uh with my boss and basically i mean she understood that this she knew right away i wouldn't support it that's why they waited until the last minute to tell me mm. i think and then you know, I, I tried to push back said, saying, you know, this is a bad idea. We shouldn't publish this at the Christian post. There used to be a, there had been a process where we would really go through and talk about things before we published an editorial. It had been a place where we could push back against each other and, and, and find a common ground. And we had lost that somewhere along the way during the Trump era. And, and now it was just like, we're doing this. We don't care what you think. It, it doesn't matter anymore what you think. And I just felt like, uh, and really, I mean, the, the really, the thing that really put the nail in the coffin was when I was told, I, you know, I said, if you publish this, you're announcing that you're on team Trump. And, and the response was, yes, that's what, yes, yes, we are. Yeah. And I was like, well, I can't be part of this anymore. So I just sort of, I left on the spot. I didn't, you know, and then, then I had to go tell my wife, this is not <laughs> something I would recommend, uh, you know, you know, first talk, talk it over with your wife, but uh, yeah, I just sort of did it on the spot and then had to go <laughs> tell my wife I left. I, I just quit my job. So. How did that go? <laughs> she, she was actually supportive. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, she understood why I did what I did. So. That's got to be scary, though. It was. It was very scary. Yeah, yeah. Now, there were other times uh, subsequent to your leaving. I'm curious, for example, January 6, 2021. I, I know that morning when I started to see things happening, I really thought, maybe naively, that this would break the fever, if you will. Mm -hmm. The fever would break. This is one of those just historic incidents that, okay, surely we can... You know, this this is all kind of uh, theater. This is big enough and important enough and, and extreme enough to where rational minds have to set aside the theater, the theatrics of it all and come together. Were you when that was happening, were you of that mindset? And specifically, I'm curious if you were checking the Christian Post to see if maybe this was a wake up call for for your 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 former colleagues there. Well, I, I was naive as well. <laughs> Mm. Uh, you know, I, I did not go on the Christian post. I have a difficult time reading that website anymore just because of the, you know, past experience. So um, I'm not sure where they were, what they were saying on January 6th or afterward or what they were publishing about it. But I think especially after, the, you know, that later that evening of January 6th, Lindsey Graham's speech really opened my eyes like, wow, this is really happening. This is, they're, they're actually going to break with Trump over this. Yeah, it you know, for 
how long did that last? You know, it was like, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're back to like supporting Trump again. Um, so I, I don't know. Par- partisanship is a powerful drug, man. That see, that's the thing, like looking at how the organization, the Christian post, uh, transformed over time, you know, access to power has got to be so seductive and the fear of the loss of access has to be sort of uh, defining in terms of the decisions that they were making. And then over time, you reinforce that in your mind and reinforce it in your mind. And um, around the, the tables where decisions are being made, I can only imagine how how this uh, this went on. But I, I was I, I appreciate you being so candid about, you know, your time there and leaving there. I also really respect how difficult of a decision it must have been to leave there. Cause listen, we all have to buy groceries and pay the rent or the mortgage or what have you and uh, feed the dogs and all that good stuff. But um, you know, so th- there is a very real concrete cost to standing on principles, which I, I really respect. So <laughs> I would like to press one more question and, and then uh, start to maybe wrap up, but I- I'd like you to put on your proverbial red MAGA hat for a second. Not that you have one, but more to help us understand some of the dynamics at work. Uh, you, you've heard analyses from folks who've, who've remained within the uh, Trumpist version of conservative circles about those who've been opposed to all that, Trump and Trumpism. Can, ha- have there been analyses that you found more accurate or, or, or persuasive even? Uh, speak like from, from MAGA folks explaining why other conservatives have become never Trumpers. So why a MAGA conservative believes that a never Trumper would become why a conservative would become a never Trumper. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to think of like some good, you know, that after it's funny after, I mean, after January 6th, there were a couple of pieces from people who sort of apologized in a, in a sense to never Trumpers and saying like, Oh, I get it. Now you, you were right about Trump uh, or your, con- or at least your concerns were legitimate. Right. And, and I didn't see that, but you did, you know, the, it's just, you know, the arguments I, I often hear are just like, you know, well, <laughs> I can only think of the dumb arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this squish and disloyalty and, you know, I don't know, just I, I, I it's hard. that's why I asked, because I can't I haven't heard I mean, any- the, the usual one is you're just doing it to be accepted, to mm-hmm. be accepted in sort of, uh, you know, liberal cocktail parties like I've ever been invited to <laughs> a cocktail party. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, to be accepted, man, have like, have we met like, do you know my life like that, that just doesn't doesn't yeah. seem to add up, but that's, that's good. That's a, a nice straw man to set up. So I do want to ask you about one sort of big issue, just because it helps me contextualize. It's so easy to get blinded and wrapped up in talking about Trump and Trumpism and, and the, the stuff that that's trending on Twitter, but just, just as one larger issue, that's been uh, a big issue in our, in our country and our politics for a long time, many Christians abortion is really the one issue that it's like a sun around which all other issues rotate, the gravity of abortion, keeping all other views in a particular orbit. Have you found that also? And and if so, have you tried to have conversations with other Christians about abortion or being pro-life more broadly speaking, as it relates to all the rest of our political engagement? I would say that's only true for a segment of conservatives and a segment of evangelicals and actually if you look at the polling a lot of trump supporting evangelicals trump supporting conservatives do not rank abortion very high among their list of priorities but of course there is the pro-life movement you know those who rank at number one right and it's you know and it's a top priority for me as well and so it it depends on who you're talking to but you know i think and so well, in the situation now that we're in is that it may be that Roe v. Wade gets overturned and do in part and do to, you know, the fact that Trump had three Supreme Court appointments. And that would mean most likely it would mean that it would become a state level issue rather than a national issue. 
so it'll be interesting to see what happens then, because then you can no longer say you have to support this awful Republican candidate because the other person will support a pro-choice, will appoint some pro-choice judges to the Supreme Court. And that's not going to matter anymore. You can't make that argument anymore. So, which is, you know, what they did with Trump. So, yeah. But, but also, you know, I think for uh, pro-lifers, I think the bit, one thing that's missed is I think that in the long term, even though even with those supreme three supreme court nominees in the long term trump did more damage to the pro-life cause because ultimately if it goes back to the states it's still going to be a matter of convincing people you know it's this it's all about persuasion the abortion thing isn't about supreme court judges it's about persuasion that's what they miss and to have supported uh donald trump who is so anti-life when it comes to the lives of immigrants and refugees and, you know, and being a race baiter and all these other sorts of things. He did tremendous damage to the pro-life cause because he's been so closely associated with the pro-life movement now that ultimately in the long term, that more important job of persuasion, you know, we're worse off after Trump. Wow. Well, that's a quite a take to drop on me about an hour into our conversation. I feel like we could have another hour long conversation just on that. Wow. I, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way, you know, because that, that in some of the conversations I have with friends who are still, you know, very supportive of, of Trump and what, what he did in office, I might say, well, what policies are you talking about? And it's, you know, the three judges. And now we're looking at the possibility of abortion going back to the States, but I hadn't even thought about it that way that the actually in the long run, doing damage to the more full pro-life cause, more holistic pro-life cause. That's an interesting, interesting perspective. But as I mentioned, we're about an hour into it. And uh, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate your thoughts and, and just feel like I have so many more questions now. But um, curious if you have any questions for me. I do have a question for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> so like, like I said, you know, at American Values Coalition, we are trying to build a community of people who in their own life have seen how misinformation and disinformation from right-wing media sources has led to the radicalization and splits within their own families, within their own communities, neighborhoods, churches. Have you seen that in your life? splits in in organizations and churches yes oh yeah 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 but I, but i was the subject of it a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> because I, i've been asking these questions and i wouldn't say i was i was cynical but i saw certain very early on after i became a christian because i didn't become a christian until my late 20s uh, so when when i went into church i started seeing things very early on that weren't that that were at odds with what I was reading in scripture and some of the sound, more sound theology that, that was making sense to me um, in, in terms of who, who we were primarily at an identity level as a people, you know, and oftentimes, whether it was in the lead up to the Iraq war or the 04 election, later on, Sarah Palin, uh, my kids went to a Christian school. So seeing some of the guest speakers that they would bring in, you know, and, and I, I shared this story with, with a friend last night that, uh, one of the guest speakers, her entire talk was about the Marxism and socialism and radicalism of Barack Obama. And I'm thinking, we're a classic education Christian school. Like, what does this have to do with classical Christian education? And just asking that question, man, I got screamed out of the auditorium. I was threatened out in the parking lot. So uh, so that that's actually one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and bringing in folks like yourself that are doing really good work in the culture you know, folks who are trying to address these divides and help us remember who we are primarily as a people, whether that's in a pluralistic way, you know, or not outside of churches and or or inside of churches, you know, what, what are our primary values? Um, and I just like to have these conversations because, listen, I know that I can't make a dent, let alone a, a drop in the, the listenership of, of Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson. 
But, you know, a lot of pastors who are aware of this problem say, you know, I have an hour a week with them, or maybe the church as a whole has two or three hours a week with them. But Fox News primetime has 15 or 20 or 25 hours with them. So any any time that somebody who might be otherwise listening to OANN or, or Newsmax, even one hour or 15 minutes listening to something like this, or not just mine, but, you know, the work that you've been doing, reading one of your pieces, uh, there's there's a lot of great written work on American Values Coalition. Uh, there's a lot of great written work on napnasworth.com. And um, there's other podcasts that are along these lines, like what David French is doing with uh, Curtis Chang on Good Faith, other other podcasts that are that are in this lane. Any amount of time that we can have someone who might be inclined to be feeding their minds with with misinformation, and we can distract that just by one degree, I think that's that's time well spent. It makes it all worthwhile, you know, because we're not gonna we're not gonna snap our fingers and change all of these problems just like that. It doesn't happen that way. I think it happens one conversation at a time, one relationship at a time, gradually over time. You know what I mean? So that, that's kind of what drives me. Interesting question. Nobody asked me that question quite like that. So interesting question. So now before we go, we need to know how we can find more information about you, American Values Coalition, and all the rest of the great work that you're doing. Yeah, go to AmericanValues.org and, and sign up for our email list. And actually, one of the things you'll get when you sign up for our email list is what we call our Truth Advocates Handbook, where we talk about a lot of these things about how to have conversations with people who uh, in your family who have been radicalized and, and how to be a good consumer of news information and, and uh, all sorts of great information that we've compiled into that handbook. And then you'll get our weekly newsletter as well. And you also, you'll also find links to, we have a Twitter profile and Facebook page, pages as well. AmericanValues.org. Man, talk about one of the most needed services or, you know, um, abilities or skills is, is to be a more informed consumer of news. That's uh, that's terrific. But I, I appreciate all that you're doing. And I appreciate just getting to spend some time with you, getting to know you better. It was really um, it was really a privilege. I, so thanks so much for, for coming in. Yeah, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. You bet. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button. Leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend. Tell a friend about Talk Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. We're easier to recommend than ever. It's politicsandreligion.podbean.com. And you can even support our program through the Patreon app on our site. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.